Can you welcome this mighty woman of God? This is Pastor Bonnie Chavda, you guys. Let's go. Thank you. Well, good morning, saints. Eden family, it's such a joy and a privilege for me to get to come home here from time to time and just bury my head in the drinking trough together with you. And I'm so, so thankful. Um, I, I know that I need to get on with this, so uh, I, I have crafted for you, I mean, I'll just be honest, I, I was raised by an old cowboy and he used to always tell me when I would get intimidated about stuff, we all put our pants on one leg at a time. So this morning I couldn't find which pant leg to put what leg in and so um, we are going to venture into the waters of what I hope will be a very encouraging message for you individually. But I want to uh, position it with an introduction referring to, it's terrible when people introduce you with stuff like that because suddenly everybody's assuming that you're the font of all wisdom and you know, got everything. No, everybody puts their pants on one leg at a time. And Debbie is my witness as to the, dis it is so unfair to be a female. I mean, Get ready to go out in public. You got to repaint the barn, shore up the foundation, rebuild the rafters, hang new doors, come on. And you guys just jump out of bed, throw on a shirt and maybe wash your face and you're gone. Gee. So anyway, I have tried to make a very condensed version of the true biblical theology that begins in our origin story in Eden, in our Bibles. But there are critical pieces of this origin story that give all the more meaning and revelation to what Jesus has done and therefore to the significance and the purpose in our own lives individually and to the church. So just bear with me, hang with me. I'm going to read what I have tried to put together for you. And then I hope we just get to go into a Bible story. So you ready? You know, where's Abe? Is Abe still in here? Or did he go to take a coffee break or lay down to catch his breath? That's, that's quite all right. I, I, I want to say, we're all aware, and for some of us who may be newcomers, maybe not even a believer, maybe watching online or get this later, I encourage you, get to a place like this on the gathered community celebrations, Sundays, Wednesdays, whenever they do them, because you can experience as a human being the reality of the supernatural atmosphere. It's not some kind of, you know, psychological trip it's reality and we all he called it juicy we all feel it we can experience it and whether you're a born again believer or not you will experience it when we, what we call the glory the anointing is thickened but part of the reason my friends is because the real truth that in Jesus Christ heaven and earth have been put back together and the Bible says that we who have been born again with this exquisite gift of salvation that we need to give to everyone who doesn't have it yet is that we have come into a mountain. And today, for instance, I was looking at Abe while he was leading and it was so apparent. I mean, it's a wonder that we couldn't actually see all the gathered angels in festal garments like the Bible said, but we felt them. And there are certain, even as, you know, Abe as leading and stuff, if you noticed his countenance, yeah, he was sweating a little. 
but the, the fierceness on his face was the fact that in his human body, he was actually connected in worship to that other realm and he was harmonizing together and not just him, all of us, harmonizing together with those spiritual realities and frankly, persons. So I know I'll blow your mind if I can. Mine's already gone, so you have to bear with me. All right, I'm going to just read what I've written to you. I'm going to read from scripture and I'm going to throw in a few of my comments. Okay, Hebrews 12, it says this. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. We experience this when we gather together. It's true individually in our lives when we walk in the city street or pray in our prayer closet or cook dinner or take a bath. You have come to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all. That's very important. To the spirits of the righteous made perfect to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel, which was the first shedding of human blood in the human story. Other blood was shed. God shed the blood of innocent animals in order to take a skin and cover the nakedness of the man and the woman. These things, friends, have so much significance for our lives. See to it, turn to your neighbor and say, see to it, that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now, as he has promised, once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Say, not only earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken. What needs to be taken away, not just what's weak, and what, but what is illegitimate, what is untrue, what is in opposition to what God has willed for his heavens and for his earth. Are you Pentecostals? <laughs> Good gravy. Somebody should have said hallelujah, amen, or oh me on that. The removing of what can be shaken, that is created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Say remain. Remain. Therefore, say therefore. Therefore. Since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. My commentary. God's rule through his heavenly host, non-human imagers has a direct intersection with us, his human imagers in life on earth. Mount Zion of Hebrews 12, to which we have come, situates us properly for purpose and God's appointment in our lives. The visible and invisible realms are not separate from one another. The biblical story is about the restoration of God's rule on earth and heaven through his imagers, human and non-human, to restore Eden and reenact his original plan to live with his human creations, those who are like him, who image him, along with his invisible, spiritual, non-human, divine family, and have us all as one family on earth administering and stewarding creation. At the beginning, Eden, that garden described in our biblical origin story, was just a little slice of creation. It was a mountain with a river breaking forth out of it. It was just a little part of the whole globe. God wanted through his promise and his covenant, through his command and mandate given to Adam and Eve prior to their departure from him to make the rest of the world like Eden. Call 
called the Garden of God, where he lived and they lived with him. Post that fall is where the biblical story moves down through several attempted reboots in how God works in his imagers and in his visible creation towards restoration. Say restoration. Tell your neighbor, we're moving towards restoration. Say, we are a part, a significant part, individually, communally, of God's restoration project. Say, I'm on a mission from God. We need some sunglasses and I kind of saw the Blues Brothers outfit here. We used to do that in the watch. 30 year corporate prayer thing every Friday night. That's my DNA and my family. But anyway, we've, we've done some fun and crazy stuff, but no juicier than you. So, post that fall is where the biblical story moves down through several failed reboots in how God works in his imagers and in his visible creation toward restoration. That reality necessitated the intervention through a new son of uncorrupted blood. A second man, the last Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, for since death came through a man, Adam, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. Can you say amen? amen? For as in Adam all die, so there are living human beings walking around us every day who have not received this inexplicable gift and they are dead. We are really living in, what was that, World War Z or something with the zombies? Bong, 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 bong. And listen, without Christ, no wonder people do horrendous, crazy, ridiculous things. They're zombies. Oh, well. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ, say in Christ, all will be made alive. Hallelujah. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then, and by the way, sorry to tell you, we just shot a big hole in your rapture theory. I should move on. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all, say all, all. dominion, authority, and power. You know, we're talking about earth and heaven now intersected, right? We're talking about this and Christ's intervention into this to bring things together and reboot God's restoration plan. Hey, come on. Absolutely right, Gail. I dedicate the Bible story part of this to you in particular and to Debbie and to many of you who have been on the journey of this community that once dwindled down to 25 persons. <laughs> and look what the Lord has done. <laughs> then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom of God, uh, the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. Can you say until? We are dynamically engaged in this until. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam. Say the last Adam. 
a life-giving spirit. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. Two important additional pieces of our biblical origin story, not typically integrated into our reading of our Bible and the story of God's redemption through his son are the events of Genesis 6 and Genesis 11, where certain members of the invisible imagers called messengers or angels in the Bible took a decision to leave their properly created assignment. The domain given them, I'm quoting in generalities from Peter and Jude and James and Paul and Jesus and John in our Bibles took a decision to leave their properly and created assignment the domain given them not just spatially but authoritatively principalities powers authorities and with the heavenly knowledge they possessed as God's intended servants, took a decision to cohabitate with human whiz women, producing a race of giants, called in scripture Nephilim, Rephaim, and Anakim, and who later often occupied mountains, and were the sworn enemies of the people of God determined to annihilate them. And Genesis 11, I know there's a bunch of stuff going off in your head going, what in the world? We're moving on. I'm going to leave all of this like a big steaming bag of loveliness <laughs> with your amazing pastor and apostolic leaders here. And Genesis 11, the event at Babel, the city built by Nimrod, the hunter, who also built the great city of Nineveh and a few others. Noah's grandson, that first city was built in a flat valley between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers that flowed out of Eden. In what is now Iraq and where, according to Moses, in Deuteronomy 32, God dispossessed, divorced, the nations of his human family because of their rebellion in departing from him. And in that story, you will find the place where he speaks of my spirit will not always dwell in man. Watch out. <laughs> Divorced the nations of his human family because of their rebellion in departing from him as had occurred in the garden. As, with man, as had occurred in Genesis 6 with the angels. <clears throat> with the angels. To follow their hearts and pursue their own plans independent from and ultimately in league with heavenly powers in opposition to God and his plan for the earth. We see the heavenly father's final reboot in the incarnation of the son within the Godhead, the anointed one, the Lord Jesus Christ, and extended through the church in the earth with the giving of the spirit at Pentecost. Pentecost was the announcement, I'm going to remarry the earth, the families of the earth, like he promised Abraham back to myself but that moment happened at Pentecost it was the undoing of Genesis 11 and the divorcing of the nation this is the restoration project friends that we have been called into this is why the great commission is the great commission this is why it says the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news I don't know about you but I'm getting revived the unseen realm is an inextricable part of what's happening with us. When you understand this, it gives full meaning to everything Christ did in his life and ministry in earth and properly orients our story as God's people on earth in every generation since Jesus has been enthroned in high heaven. The purity and supernatural nature of Jesus' conception and birth by a human woman, Mary, 
his encounters with angels, confrontations with demons, his confrontations and callings of men and powers, his interactions in gardens and wildernesses, his events on mountains and coming down off of mountains, from his baptism in the Jordan, transfiguration in Mount Hermon, which is the Genesis 6 location, by the way, with Moses and Elijah, his ministry in Jericho, which was the great opposing city that he had, they had to break through to begin to possess their inheritance, though it had already been given to them. Um, his entry into Jerusalem, which was a foreshadowing of what is coming when he returns with the holy city coming down like a bride prepared for her husband, re-inhabiting the earth. Oh, come on. Come on, come on. His being sent specifically to the offspring of Israel and then sending his disciples out into the nations are all explicit demonstrations announcing he has come to claim, reclaim his creation. The accomplishment of the launch of his program through the beginning of the climax of his mission, specifically pertaining to earth in the mystery, reality, and power of his death on the mountain of Calvary. Following through his descent into Sheol, his proclamation there and his triumphal ascent into the heavens where he lives and reigns, interceding for all those who claim him as Savior and Lord. All of this, creation is moving toward the climax of his plan, which is his re-entry into earth at his coming. So as we wait for his appearing, in the course of our lives, we occupy this strange space of the already and not yet. Look at your neighbor and say, hey, it's already and not yet. And this is a unique place to stand. It's why we need a full revelation that we do now in this body by the spirit occupy two dimensions simultaneously that are all around us in reality and affect us, but we are meant to affect them. The event of Pentecost and the giving of the Holy Spirit to his church is the follow on of God's repossessing the nations into his eternal family. And that is where we come in. There's so much more to say. But that introduction speaks directly to the positioning and practical mandate on this community and the network of relations God is establishing in this Eden. So I commend you to God and to his leaders and the gifts he has placed in your midst. In Psalm 46, it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though everything's shaking. Oh, wait, that's not what, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The holy habitation of the Most High. Friends, recognize it's not out there somewhere. It's here. <laughs> God is in her midst. She shall not be moved. God will help her just at the break of dawn. And there's always the midnights and the dawning that follows. 
So wherever, whenever, however we find ourselves, personally or in the wider picture in our world, we are those who carry the light and announce his rising. Looking to the horizon and saying, there is a king in Zion and this kingdom is unshakable in the earth. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. Oh yeah. Friends, don't be offended if you're a Christian by certain Christians saying, we won, talking about the, the pushback, the public policy, electorate, citizenry pushback against butchering children is a victory. Jesus. I'm about to get in the flesh and start telling you what I think about things. <laughs> Hallelujah. I know, but we, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, we're going we're gonna to move on here. Darren, I'll just tell you this. I'm seeing the plumb line. I mean, he's just going like that. Uh, he, he can explain that to you later. Ha ha ha. The nations rage, kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. So I ask you a question. How does the earth hear his voice? Anybody? Through the church. And I shared with you a, a, an encounter and a, an amazing miracle in my own life about the birth and life of our fourth child, Aaron, where I encountered the voice of the Lord from Psalm 29, 9 that says the voice of the Lord causes the deer to give birth. And what I encountered was the voice of the Lord is not words of human wisdom and knowledge. It is the spirit of God. And no one in the earth, no one in this city carries that voice, but you. And so we must align with him, fold into him, become more and more integrated into the one who is the spirit of the sovereign Lord. Come on. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. Hey! The Lord of hosts is with us! I said, the Lord of hosts is with us. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, strap on. <laughs> the God of... Je The God of Jacob is our fortress. We have come into his city. We are unshakable, immovable. Advancing. Come, say come. Behold the works of the Lord. I feel like, you know, Charlton Heston at 10 commandments, right? Oh, and those sea parts. Come, behold. It's time to part some seas and lead the people out of bondage and into their promised possession. <laughs> and you've seen it this weekend in the healings and deliverance and salvations that have been wrought. Come behold the works of the Lord. How he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease. Could we believe for that? 
Could we think that we might be given authority to bind principalities and powers and then to direct the hearts and minds of men to loose them from darkness and bring a pause on nations destroying nations? It won't happen through pacifism. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. Do you believe that? It doesn't happen through pacifism. He burns the chariots with fire. The instruments of war, our God is a consuming fire. Be still. Shalom. Shalom. In the midst of all of this, chaos and turmoil and trouble and great desolations and signs, you, my friend, are a superconductor of the person of the Holy Spirit. And just like superconductors in science, you must be cool down to where there is no inner turmoil. And then you can transfer the power. Say superconductor. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Stand on your feet. Let's shout out together. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And turn to your neighbor and say, Selah. Pause and think about that. <laughs> All right, sit down. There is a river running out of this place. And with that, do I have another half hour? Okay. Do I? Not quite. 15 minutes? Do I? We'll see what happens here. Okay. Second, are you good? Yes. Hopefully, you've got something at least to think about already, right? Please. Second Kings chapter 4, verse 8. One day, Elisha went on to Shunem, where a wealthy woman lived who urged him to eat some food. So that whenever he passed that way, you know the way to a man's heart. <laughs> he would turn in there to eat food. So she said to her husband, look now, I know, I discern there's something, this is a holy man continually coming our way. Let us make a small room on the roof on a high place with walls and put there for him a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. Listen, that was a big deal. It, it, it could only be done by a wealthy person. You couldn't go down to Home Depot and pick up the stuff to do that. It was a big deal. So that whenever he comes to us, he can go in there. She wanted him to come and stay a while. One day he came there and he turned into the chamber and rested. Say rested. And he said to Gehazi, oh, that's a story. You ought to go read about Gehazi. This was still when he had a chance. <laughs> he kept blowing it. And finally, he really blew it in the next couple of chapters. But anyway, Gehazi, his servant, say servant. Call this Shunammite. And when Gehazi had called the Shunammite woman, she stood before Elisha. Oh, sorry, she, st she stood before Gehazi. And they converse for a moment. Gehazi goes to Elisha and he says to, uh, uh, Eli uh, sorry, Elisha says to Gehazi, say to her, look, you've taken all this trouble for us. What can we do for you? Would you have me speak a word to the king or to the commander of the army? Say king and commander. She answered, I dwell among my own people. What was going on here is that in the future, because number one, this woman had no offspring. When her husband died, she would become the ward of her family. They would inherit all of her stuff and whatever good graces were in their heart, she would be utterly dependent on that. She felt secure in it. So she said, I don't need edicts from the powers that be. 
I'll be secure. Elisha says, what then? Speaking to Gehazi. He hasn't spoken with the woman yet. Do you understand? Okay, he has, he's only spoken through Gehazi up until this point. So Elisha says, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi says, well, haven't you noticed, boss? There are no kids running around here. She has no son and her husband is old. <laughs> so he says, call her. And when he had called her, Gehazi called her, now she's, it says she stood in the doorway. Say she stood in the doorway. I believe that in this latest visitation and iteration that begun a number of months back, that this community is literally standing on the threshold of an open door. And I believe with all my heart that there are images and promises in this story that are real for you, individually, as families, and as this community, and this city and region. So Elisha, now he speaks to her the first time, directly. At this season, about this time next year, ooh, let's just lay into that. Say about this time next year. <laughs> you shall embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord, O oh man of God, do not lie to your servant. But the woman, say but. One of my favorite sayings is God always has a big butt. But the woman conceived. I want to speak to any area of barrenness and impossibility in your life and circumstance and declare to you today in this mountain, but God. Where there is disease resident in your bodies right now, but God. Where there is financial instability and shaking, I declare to you, but God. Where there is division and breakdown in families, I declare to you, but God. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. Remember this? If you don't remember anything else this morning, God has a big butt. But the woman conceived and she bore a son and about that time the fall about that time the following spring as Elisha had said to her and when the child had grown he went out one day to his father among the reapers and he said to his father oh my head my head and his father said to the servant take him to his mother and when he had lifted him and brought him to his mother the child sat on her lap till noon and there he died. She had held her living promise, supernatural, enabling her old husband and her in the barrenness and impossibility of her own body to come together and conceive life because God had determined life where there is death, fruit where there is barrenness. It's his nature. But look what she does. And this is my word for you. She didn't. <laughs> Call all the reapers in from the harvest. Get the household together. The promise has died. That is not what this woman did. And it should not be what you ever do. She went up, say go up. go up. Tell your neighbor, neighbor. neighbor. What, dead what dead thing are you carrying? Go up. Go up. Say go up. Go up. Go up. Go up. Go up. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door behind him and went out. Notice, it, it, it's even referring to this dead child as the him, as though he's still there. But the important thing is she goes back to the place where that promise was conceived. Yeah. 
She knows that something evil has intervened in the divine will of God for her life and household and future. And she is not willing to agree with that wicked assault. She shuts the door so nobody will even know. Be careful how we commiserate with one another over the hurts, traumas, disappointments, things of the past, present, and future that are negative. We are standing in a mountain. Two dimensions. It's where Christ is seated and we with him in the highest throne of heaven, putting principalities and powers under his feet. And most of all, his last enemy, death. Then she called to her husband and said, send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys. I want to go quickly to visit the man of God and I'll come back. And he's thinking, this religious woman, I'm in the middle of harvest. What the heck is she, a typical woman? <laughs> and so he, blah, 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 about her religiosity. And she says, it's okay, honey, shalom, shalom, be at peace. She saddled the donkey, said to her servant, drive. <laughs> Say drive. Do not slacken the pace unless I tell you. She set out, came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. She went up. Say, go up. When the man of God saw her coming, he said to Gehazi, his servant, look, it's the Shunammite. Run at once and meet her and say to her, all is well with you? Didn't she just say all is well? Is all well with you and the child and your husband? And she said, yes, all is well. She came to the mountain to the man of God. She caught hold of his feet and Gehazi came to push her away. But the man of God said, let her alone for she is in bitter distress and the Lord has hidden me. This great prophet who knows everything about everybody all the time and I can't see a thing. And she said, did I ask you for a son? Didn't I say don't mess with me? So he says to Gehazi, gird up your loins, take my staff. It's like Moses, you know, it's the, miracles, the miracle wand. And go, don't greet anyone if anybody greets you and lay my staff on the face of the child. And the Shunammite woman said, as God is my witness and as you have life in your body, I'm not leaving this mountain. Well, Gehazi takes the staff and he runs off on this mission. He laid the staff on the face of the child and nothing happened. He came back. He says, boss, dead boy, dead as a doornail. So Elisha came to the house. Say, Elisha came. Where did he come? He came into the place that had been prepared for him to stop and tarry, to lay down and rest, to eat and be refreshed. As you welcome the Lord of glory in your hearts, in your houses, and in this house, I promise you, you will see resurrection. He saw the child laying dead on his bed he surely remembered the prophetic promise over this house. He went in and shut the door and prayed to the Lord. And then he laid on the child. He put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes and his hands on his hands and stretched himself upon him. And the flesh of the child became warm. He got up again and walked once back and forth in the house and went up and stretched himself upon him. And then the child sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. 
He said to Gehazi, call the Shunammite. And when she came to him, he said, pick up your son. Pick up your son. Eden, I'm saying to you, pick up your son. Pick up your son. Pick up your son. But do you know what she did? She didn't have a Holy Ghost celebration, dancing and singing and praising the Lord. No. It says she fell at his feet, Elisha's feet, first and worshiped. And then she picked up her son. This is also a revelation, <clears throat> a revelation for us. When God moves, when he answers us, celebrate him first. The giver and not the gift. And Elisha, and then it goes into another story talking about Naaman and dipping seven times. And if you're on your third dip, keep dipping. But it goes beyond to talk about the things that get shaken in this woman's life. Her husband dies, famine comes. They have to go into Moab, into a foreign land to try and survive. Her husband dies there. She comes back, now she's a widow. What does she have? She has her living promise. Her son is with her. But when she comes back, according to the custom of the day, you remember the first thing that the prophet asked her? Do you need me to talk to the king or the commander? She comes home and by law, she had been gone during the famine. The king could take possession of people's estates and probably he had instilled his army in her estate. And she comes back and now she definitely needs an intercession with the king because of the commander. Are you there? Are you with me? So she goes to the court of the king, bringing her son with her. But look how God arranges things. And I wanna tell you, the Lord has arranged the backstory, the outer, the, the ante rooms or whatever of your life and your calling. He is working in ways you do not know. And what you need to do is lay hold of the Lord Jesus and not let him go. Because he's working in the periphery on your behalf for his own glory. And there in the king's court that day, Gehazi, who had been kicked out of the prophet's service because of what he did with the whole name and thing. But now Gehazi has weaseled his way into another place of power. And he is there to regale all the miracles that he saw in his time of uh, tenure with the prophet. And this particular day, he's telling the story. The king says, tell me again that story about the Shunammite woman and the resurrection of that dead boy. Gehazi is telling this story to the king at the moment the king's secretary comes in and says my lord there is a woman from Shunem waiting to see you and he says what that woman the Gehazi's telling me yeah that woman bring her in she comes in with her son the living testimony because she refused to let go of the promise that God had given and some of you need to realize, you need to invite the Holy Spirit to lay again on the dead thing that was originally promised by God and allow him to breathe. And so she regained everything in her testimony. This community has been through the promise, the dying, and there are literal women and some men, I'm sure, but I know two of these women that would not let him go. And this promise not only lives again but now there is a river running out of this mountain this high place this eden into the city and cities to reclaim what god has ordained to have as his own possession